Um, this is the uh, Commission on Disabilities meeting for August 3rd, 2020, beginning at 6.32 p.m., uh, doing a verbal roll call. We have um, Christine Zanidi. Christina Zanidi? Uh, you only have to roll call the board, me the members. Oh, whoops, sorry about that. Okay, okay. Um, so we have <laughs> Crystal Evans. I'm present. And Mary Russo. Present. And uh, Robin Torpe. I'm here, thank you. And Lynn Valancourt is here. Um, and Mary Beth, do I have to say your name too? That, just that Christina and I are present. Okay, and then, um, so the first uh, item on the agenda is approval of the minutes for July 6, 2020. I recognize that we have a, uh, a guest person here, but we'll just get through approval of the minutes and then move on to our guest speaker. I've read and um, perused the uh, meeting minutes and I approve. Okay, so we have a motion for approval from Robin Torpe. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, and can I have a second from somebody else for approval of the minutes? Approved, Mary Russo. Okay, so Mary Russo, a second, second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 So and are any opposed? Okay, minutes are approved for the meeting um, that we uh, held last month. Um, and so the first item um, for new business is that we have Jim Arsenault here, correct? Lynn, can I interrupt for just half a second? So any motions that the commission takes, I also need a roll call. We're on a Zoom meeting. Oh, okay. Sorry well, about that. Okay, so um, so motions on accepting the minutes. Can I have a roll call? Um, Mary Russo? Mary Russo? If you say aye. If you say aye or yes. There you go. You accept. Um, and Crystal Evans? Um, Crystal Evans, aye. And Robin Torpe? Robin Torpe, aye. And Lynn Valancourt is an aye. Thank you. Okay. Um, so welcome, Jim. You are um, our guest speaker today. <laughs> um, and uh, we were, it was requested to have you come to the meeting today so that we could go ahead and um, have some questions answered um, from committee board members. And I believe, Mary Beth, you have those questions that we had brought up from last time. So I am going to um, hand the questions on over to Mary Beth because she does have them written down and I don't have them right in front of me. So uh, Mary Beth, if you can go ahead and take that item from the agenda and um, we'll start. Certainly, so if we could, where Jim is on the line, I'd like to address the question or have him address the questions that were posed regarding DPW matters. And then Jim is kind enough to come this evening um, on his own time to help us out this evening. So I wanted to make sure that we try and address his. So, and Jim had the questions, so he can present on each of them, but some, I'll just kind of highlight what they were. Uh, number one, were the picnic tables at public places are not access on, on accessible surfaces, such as playgrounds and at Sunset Lake. Um, also, South Braintree Square, the trees and the sidewalks, curb cuts at Braintree Rug and Walgreens having gaps in them, and curb cuts at Hancock Street and Hancock Place also having gaps. Also, what is, the, uh, what is happening with the audible signs where the upgrades are occurring in South Braintree Square? Hancock and Pearl Street um, during snowstorms has not been in compliance. And then also um, there were questions of, for Beld, but Jim can also help answer those on what would trigger the upgrades to the audible signals and the signaling uh, of the lights in, in, the, um, in the squares, in, in particular South Branch Square. All right, so um, the picnic tables at the public spaces at Sunset Lake. Um, so in that particular um, question, we have two additional um, handicap accessible um, picnic tables that will be brought to Sunset Lake. One off the accessible entrance to the playground, um, off of the parking lot, and another off of the concrete pad by the pavilion in the beach area. So that's what we're doing to address that concern. Um, the next item will be um, why are the construction plans not coming before the condition of disabilities? So um, any new building construction project um, would come before, I imagine it would come before the COD. 
um, says all, almost all of our construction projects are just repair and replace projects. They're not new new projects. We're putting in some new buildings. Any new building projects we implement would come before the planning board and at one point, and then also before the CUD as well, if needed. So usually it's the quarterback by the planning board. They determine what, what uh, commissions and, and what who needs to review what. Um, all construction activities are required to meet ADA regulations and the contractor is required to adhere to them. Um, in South Braintree uh, Square, sorry, the trees and the sidewalk, the members, um, so, so you're asking about the, um, you know, putting grates on them instead of, um, in, instead of mulch. So the sidewalks on South Braintree Square are, are oh, and it's also about, um, trees and instead of mulch and trying to find a fund the sidewalks to make a modular. So the sidewalks along the South Bay and Tree I mentioned talking about trying to make the sidewalks wider too as well. And so the sidewalks along South Bay Tree and Tree Square are as wide as they can go without having to do a taking. So we'd have to take property. Um, the trees and the sidewalk um, work better than, than mulch because what happens is when you use tree grates, they restrict the growth of the tree. And so time, a lot of times they can push the concrete up on other areas and cause issues relative to the, not only the, the sidewalk, but also the road because it, it's, it limits their ability to, um, to be able to move. So with that, with, if, you, if you put mulch in there, they can still move within the mulch and they get more, there's more freedom within that area. And we will continue to put mulch and make sure that it's, it's compacted and it's, and it's um, kept up. So every time there's a, it, if it's if it seems to be going down a little bit every every spring and during the summer we'll be making sure that it's maintained on a regular basis um. can i say something sure okay um the tree the width issue is not about widening the sidewalks it's that the hancock street when they added additional tree holes it narrows the sidewalk to 36 inches so what happens is in the winter when the plows plow, we don't get a clear 36 inch path of travel because they're going over the holes with the plows. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, we have to make sure we, at a minimum it's 36 inches. So we'll, I'll make sure that, you know, we're supposed to, I'll make sure that they're, they're open at least the 36 inches in okay. the winter time. You're talking about snow time, right? Yeah, but when they did the sidewalks, when the trees mm -hmm. are there, there are mm -hmm. multiple slabs that are only 36 inches to get around. Mm -hmm. So unless you clear the slab fully, what's happening is the plows are going over the holes, not over the sidewalk. So then we have all these gaps through the sidewalk and that's where the winter access issues are. But if there was the tree grates on those sidewalks, we would have a solid surface year round if the plow is not clearing the full slab, if they're going over the hole around the tree. Does that make sense? I could walk it with you at some point if you want. No, that's all right. Um, but I mean, if the plow, the plow has a set width on it, so it's only going to go that width. I mean, I don't really understand it. I mean, if you're plowing the snow and it's that width, it's going to be that width. I mean, I, well, you're saying it might go off of the slab is what you're saying, right? So, yeah, so they're the, going down the center of the sidewalk, but now the holes are in the center of the sidewalk. So they're getting all the holes when they're clearing 36 inches. They're not getting a side, they're not getting a firm surface. All right, well, I, I can uh, educate the employees to make sure that they go in the right location. I mean, this, they shouldn't be going off of the sidewalk. I see what you're saying, into the tree grate is what you're saying, right? It's into, yeah, it, they're hitting, when they're doing it, because the holes are down the center and there's mm -hmm. 36 inches goes off to the side, we no longer have center of sidewalk as the straight access point, but the plow is clearing straight down the middle. Yeah, but they so should be I, offsetting when they plow. They should be offsetting from the tree, so they shouldn't be within the the, the area. So I'll 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 educate them. Okay. Yep. So I'll take care of that. Would it uh, on, a, on a question of that? Would it be possible that you know how they they mark? You know, you, you have uh, the plow markers that tell you where you where you are and stuff. Can mm -hmm. we put plow markers or have plow markers that go at the edge of the grate when the snow is going to be coming, so that they know where the edge of the grate is? Well, I mean, in where way, the edge of the um, tree is? Well, in a, in a way you do, because you have the tree, and, the tr and, no. the, and it's in, it should be in the center of the grate. So but I mean, I mean, from, the, from the, uh, the, the, the area that's around the tree, can we mark that inner edge of where the area is around the tree so that, um, so that the plowers know where that is? Because if it's covered over with snow, they're not quite sure where that is. 
The no, other but- issue with this though is I my wheelchair fell in Hancock Street Hall last winter. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah, I know. Um, because I when the holes are full of snow, you can't tell where the actual sidewalk goes. If they're going off the sidewalk and around, we still don't have that straight path. So if you catch the edge of a hole, your whole wheelchair goes in it. Yeah, well also this year, that was a brand new tree pits that were put in. Mm -hmm. So they weren't compacted. They didn't have any integrity to them. They just went in last last year and it was only like literally a month or two. And then it started or a couple, probably about two or three months at maximum. And they didn't have the time to compact. Now they've had a whole winter of being compacted. So I think it's a different situation. Um, and then if, if you know where the tree is in the ground and you know the distance from the tree and we educate the staff about that, I believe they can hit the right location um, because they can see the tree, it's physical and it's in front of them, they see the tree. If they know it's about a foot and a half off, they should be able to maneuver their vehicles. It's it not working that way even with the curb cuts because if you look down Hancock Street, mm -hmm. a lot of the curb cuts don't go straight they go off to the side, to the side streets. So when they're plowing straight down Hancock, mm -hmm. they're missing the curb cuts entirely. So the curb cuts don't get the snow either. So it's not even just about the trees. Yeah, it's sometimes- the way the curb, snow removal's being done. Yeah, the curb cuts, sometimes they, they're trying to get something and they miss something else. I mean, it happens. And sometimes right. when the plows come, they have nowhere else to go and they push it where they don't supposed to. And that's why I'm out there shoveling myself usually in the winter yeah. time. Oh yeah. So, so that's, it's you know, the nature of the beast. We'll talk more about it later, but yeah, in the winter time, it's 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 pretty crazy. But but I can try to see how I can get them to stay off of those areas, and then we'll see how it goes. If it becomes a big issue, we'll have to revisit in the spring. So sounds fair. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, the curb cut at Braintree uh, Rug and Walgreens have gaps and. Um, curb cuts in Hancock and Hancock Place have gaps. The final resurfacing of South Braintree Square intersection is still under construction. The final paving of the roadway should be completed sometime within the week, depending on weather. So we're still redoing that South Braintree Square intersection. We're resurfacing it. Um, what is going on with the audible signal upgrades of the squares? The audible upgrades in the South Braintree Square have been ordered and a projected installation date is currently by the end of August. So we should have all brand. So now you can press a button and that particular phase, like crossing say um, Pearl Street would then actuate and it would go across. So it wouldn't be like all of them go and then you have to kind of run around to go all, you know, you just press the button for the phase that the, the street you want to cross and then you would have that, it would, it would trigger that and it would be audible too. Are they changing the flow of the crosswalks? Because right now, yeah. if you press any button, it stops all four directions. Yeah, the, the whole si signal system is going to change. Okay. All the innards are going to change. So, and then, um, so Hancock and Pearl are not in compliance during snowstorms. I said the town of Braintree always opens the roadways well before most other municipalities in the area um, do during snow events and brings the roadways down to asphalt because I see a lot of places they still even have snow on the on the roads. Staff are up all night risking life and limb to make sure the roads are open for, for the police, fire, ambulances, and other emergency vehicles, which is the priority because if they can't get to you and the police can't get to you, it's going to be ugly, you know, and we don't want that. We want to make sure people have access and able to get out. The emergency vehicles are able to get what they need during, you know, right after, dur in, during a snow event. Um, if you are talking about the sidewalks, the town tries its very best once the roads are open to get sidewalks open as quickly as possible. Often it's very difficult to find available personnel given that staff have been up all night and everybody is needed during the snow event. Um, we have no extra bodies. We, we max out on every event. However, we do our best we can and not only to do the plowing in critical areas such as Braintree Square, so, um, Braintree Square, South Braintree Square, H M M B T A, Ivory, John Mahar, The Landing, Pearl, and Hancock as best as we can, but we also clear the sidewalks around all 12 schools in, in the town, approximately 15 municipal buildings, parking lots, sidewalks, et cetera, et cetera. Given the resources we have, we do the best we can, and we always try our hardest to update open access as much as is possible for the town. I know it's not perfect, we do the best we can. We work as hard as we can, nonstop, 
and we give 110% my, me, myself, I've been out, just like I just said, shoveling, doing anything I can to make it accessible. Well, Jim, the other thing I wanted to mention too is if we are aware of a concern on the roadway, I've, I've done it many times, have called you and you've had it immediately addressed. Yeah. So it is what it is. I mean, you know, could it be better? Yes, but we, we try our best. We are out there giving it 110%. Um, I don't know what else to say. So Jim, the other question that had come up was about what would trigger upgrades to signaling on any projects. And I did have the opportunity to speak with um, one of the managers of BELD and they advise that the electric utility has no bearing on the signals, that if it's a state road, that it's the state road's responsibility, they own and maintain the signaling requirements for an intersection or at a uh, piece of equipment that is within a state road. If it's on a town-owned property, then through the engineering department, any upgrades could be triggered on a project that is usually part of you know, a bidding package that goes out with the project if there are requirements to do so plus a monetary factor. Um, but the criteria for signaling and the timing of the signals, that is all mandated by the state. Can you give us a little bit more information on the signaling if you have any? Yeah, so what happens is for, sig for any type of improvement, um, it depends on the type of improvement that's done on the roadway. So if you're doing a minor resurfacing project, um, that, that has very small impact, then, then basically what you would need to do is the um, ped crossings would, I mean, the, um, the, the ramps would have to be updated and make sure they meet um, current ADA regulations. But the regular sidewalks along it would be still not improved to that level. We're trying to change that through, you know, um, through some of, the, some of the plans we have. We're looking at all the sidewalks and trying to make priorities. So every year we're gonna have improvements to try to get more done um, the more sidewalks done, but um, it, the way the regulations work is if you make a, if you do a resurfacing project, you have to do the, 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 the pads, but you don't have to do necessarily the entire sidewalk. Um, you, obviously, if there's a divot, a major divot where you get a hole or something like that, where there could be, you know, it could be a severe problem, we have to address it. But as long as it met the ADA requirements that were in time in, that were in place at the time that were built, then, then they're acceptable. Um, but then um, as far as the, ped, the signals themselves, if you have a major reconstruction like we did in South Braintree Square, that then triggers that change because we, we put in all brand new sidewalks, curbing, all that stuff, that's a major change. So therefore we would have to then improve all of this audible signals, uh, all the signals to current um, ADA standards. And that's what we're doing in South Braintree Square. So whenever there's a major improvement, everything has to meet current ADA regulations. What about, this was pri um, prior to you coming to Braintree, but um, they did resurfacing, I think it was about 2014 of Ivory and Union and out that direction. And none of the curb cuts or audible signals at that point in that area around the T were up upgraded, how come? I mean, yeah, no, it, but why are those things not factored into construction when they're doing major resurfacing like that? No, resurfacing is, is not the trigger. When I'm talking about major reconstruction, I'm talking about wholesale, like road demolition, like pulling out curbing, pulling out sidewalks, pulling out everything getting reconstructed. That is where, the, where it triggers it. That's when the audible signals would then have to change. What about the curb cuts? What's that? What about the curb cuts? The curb, you'd ha still have to put in the pads and all that. The, that used to be that you didn't have to do that, but the, it, you know, since then the ADA said you at least got to do the pads. But this so, is um, the curb cuts at um, Corner Grossman Drive and Ivory at Union are all non-compliant by how steep they are at that intersection. Um, they're there, but they're steep, um, like more than 8.3%. Um, why were things like that not addressed when all the road was resurfaced and brought up to the height of the curb cuts at that point? So it's a new road, you're saying? They, re they, they, they resurfaced it. Down and resurfaced it at that point. Well, resurfacing is, is it, is it, like I said, there's a spectrum of resurfacing. So if you're just doing minor resurfacing versus like wholesale, like if, in other words, when we do a water project, 
-hmm. we take out uh, the whole roadway is gone, just mm -hmm. toasted. The right. sidewalks are gone. The curbing's gone. That's when all the audible signals and all that stuff have to be replaced and updated. Um, if it's just regular resurfacing, you do have to do the pads. So if, I know Bob always had the balancing act of saying, okay, when you're on a hill or a steep location, they want to make it where, he always wanted to make it where you, it would be at the angle. Because what happens is the ADA regulations do say that if there's an existing roadway and it's excessively steep, then you don't have to basically, you know, go up and then down, up and then down on the roadway. It matches the existing grade and has right. to stay with the existing grade. So trying to make it work with that existing grade, Bob has always tried to keep it. So when you're on the road and you're going onto the sidewalk, he wants to make it sloped in that direction. So that so that the side slope is, is, is steep in this direction, but he's trying to make it so it goes into that direction versus making an indentation into the road almost. I don't even know how you do it because you're at a steep slope. No, but that's a level up. area. That's not like, and it's the same in front of like um, Richmond's Hardware and the Funeral Home in Washington are other examples of cor curb cuts that are extremely steep. The curb cut exists, but the slope is too much. Well, Rich Richmond Hardware is not done yet. We're doing it right now. Right. No, I'm just saying like, yeah. these are, the road is flat there. So yeah. it's not like it's a part on a hill. We're not talking union up on the hill. We're talking at the flat point where union meets ivory and the bottom of Grossman Drive where it meets union and ivory, that whole intersection over by um, opposite Daddy's Dairy. Um, those curb cuts are very steep. Um, yeah, those those haven't been touched in a long, long time. Exactly, they're yeah, very, they're, very old. I can, um, I can feel just how my body shifts and it's like some of these curb cuts. I know there's a guy that lives right in that area who's talked about it because he's waiting for hip replacement. So him walking on the steeper curb cut is a, because of the way the cross slope is also wrong. It's not even just the slope, it's the cross slope. Um, where it's too steep in both directions and when it brings the whole sidewalk out of slant, it's harder for people with like um, hip and back issues. So, I mean, I could look at that particular location and see, but I know Ivory and um, so Ivory and Union. That's um, I mean, it's definitely an older section. There's no question about it. So, um, but I don't. You saying that paved that recently? I mean, it's been. It was resurfaced. It wasn't paved over. It yeah. wasn't ripped out and paved over. Yeah, I think it was just a. a, a yeah, so it wasn't a major reconstruction of the roadway, right? I remember no, I, it wasn't. Yeah. Okay, I remember I couldn't get through that area at all during whatever was going on because everything dropped off big. Um, well, we can look at individual sections and see. If, if yeah, we Jim, that particular about. roadway was resurfaced right in front of the transfer station because there were concerns about the spillage from the trucks, mm -hmm. and that was one way to try and mitigate it. If there are any older, oh, that yeah, that was an over that was an over that was not time. right, that so wasn't a major it went all the way through the intersection of Ivory and Union. Yeah, that's further down. That's yeah. that's near yeah, the I'm talking station further, you're talking uh, about, Mary Beth. That, 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 that was that, all ripped up at one point. Um, it was a long time ago, though, because I yeah, mean, that's for you, it was before you, it was about oh, yeah. 2014, I think. Yeah, um, I can't speak as to 14, but I, I know that. You know, we are trying to systematically, you know, try to get through the sidewalk. So we have a ranking inventory and trying to get through to make old sidewalks like that eventually compliant, you know. So if, we, if it isn't compliant, then we're going to have to progress to try to get them compliant eventually. Are we choosing priority areas, though? Like, for instance, ivory and unit sidewalks are very bad, but it's also the sidewalks that are heavily used because they're access to the T versus some side streets aren't as heavily used like there's, how a, we there's a con there's a consultant who's looking at all of this to see what the ranking should be and then we do have funding this year to address particularly sidewalks um so we do have funding available and we're going to be looking at the ranking and see where we where the priorities can be set uh through the um you know through the plan to say what what what's the most critical needed and what would be you know most bang for your buck and, and trying to prioritize that. And then Mary Beth's been working with, with me as well, trying to, to get that um, finalized. So as soon as we get that finalized, we'll, we'll look at the list and try to work uh, from you know, the highest priority and, and work our way down. Okay. Are they gonna bring 
list to the commission before everything's finalized? That's um, up to, I don't know, Mary Beth, you want to speak Well, that's to up to the town. I don't know that it's going to be coming before the, trip, the um, Commission on Disabilities. The town has put together a request through a consultant to prioritize the roadways. We're working through DPW and town administration to accomplish that as part of our transition plan update. So that would be up to administration. I would think that the priorities that would be set as far as fixing the sidewalks would probably have more to do with the condition of the sidewalk versus the frequency of it being traveled. Um, if they're taking a look at going ahead and trying to fix the sidewalks, um, and that probably would also need to be coordinated with the fixing of the roads in order to maximize the um, bang for the buck, as you say, from, from doing some of that work. So there's probably a lot more that goes into choosing which items are first versus how frequently are they traveled or if you know somebody that's traveling on that particular road. So I'm sure that they have their matrix that they take a look at. Um, and the consultant probably is aware of all those matrices that the town would need to take a look at in order to meet all the federal guidelines, the state guidelines, and to matching the scope of work that is actually presented to the construction companies. So there's a lot of other things that are in the backgrounds that probably deal with more than just the frequency of how they are traveled. Yeah. That is all correct, thank you. Thank you. I mean, for instance, the streets, the sidewalks that are in bad condition in walking neighborhoods to schools matter a lot more than a side street off of a side street. You know what I mean? Um, no, but they, they take that into consideration. Okay, the critical routes are definitely in the consideration. I've seen it and I know that's part of it. Okay. Uh, but also I'll, I will say that when whenever we do our water projects, we do a complete reconstruction. We put a brand new um, sidewalks in top of the line of curb cuts, meeting all ADA requirements, we, we mandate that on any project that we do. I know it's not the whole town at once, unfortunately, but you know we do, as we go along, we, we provide that. So it's, it's a lot of communities don't spend 3 million bucks a year, on, actually about $6 million a year at renovating you know, roadways and sidewalks and water infrastructure and all that. It's, it's, the town definitely invests a lot of money trying to get the roads in good shape and also the sidewalks. In the ramps and we're do even doing more this year we have new funding that we're getting separately to try to focus on ada requirements especially like you said ramps and stuff like that are a priority for sure so we'll be looking at those seeing where we can have uh, more aggressively work clean up some of those older items that may not be in compliance and we'll continue to try to focus on getting more useful uh, use of the funding as much as we can because we don't have a ton of it like everybody else the you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic and it's a lot of funds are hard to get around, but we do have some funding and we're trying, we're going to try to, you know, focus our funding the best we can to assist as much as is possible. So. Um, when you're contracting the um, construction companies, what are you putting in there around um, ADA compliance during construction? Well, they, they have to allow accessibility, um, obviously for, for um, whenever we're doing work, you know, you might have one side of the road that's not functional because there's just no no way they can do it that when they're doing the construction, and then the other side would then be allowed, you know, to or have some accessibility. Um, but there's all different scenarios, you know. There's there's times when, um, you know, where they do wholesale, like I said, where they're doing water re water replacement, where the the there's really no way to keep the road stable, um, so. You know, we'll try to find a path or some way to get accessibility as best we can, but it, it is difficult sometimes. Because um, I'm finding a lot of the, the contractors we use here have amazing accessibility through construction zones in other cities where they're working, but I'm not finding the same access here. Um, and, I, and in talking with them, they've told me it's directly all about the contracting and the language. Yeah, we, we, we say it in the language that they have to provide accessible um, access. So, and we'll we you know we'll work with anybody to make sure that they get where they need to go. So, if there's an issue, we'll work it out. Okay. So I believe that Jim has answered um, all of the questions presented at the last meeting that had to do with DPW. And Is it possible for me to revisit the first question? Sure. 
Okay. Yeah, it was um, regarding the um, accessible picnic tables. Yeah. Or the, the, the two new accessible picnic tables. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify, I wasn't sure if the question had more to do with not just having the picnic tables, but the actual surface that is under the picnic tables. And I wanted just to make sure that the surface that they were getting put on was a surface that someone in a chair could still get over. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Um, That's where I keep running into issues around various parks in Braintree is that the accessible picnic table will be there, but in an inaccessible area. For instance, they might put it in sand, they might put it in gravel, they might put it so far out of the way that it's like, it's nowhere remotely close to where everything else is. Well, happening. it sounds like it's gonna be right next to a, a, a concrete pad or, or both locations look like they're right off of, of, of a concrete place, I mean, access. So I'll make sure that it's right next to it's, you're saying they can't get there, basically, right? Right. In other words, if, if it's right these... next to a concrete pad, that doesn't necessarily mean that the chair can still get up to the table. Yeah. The chair would have to be where the chair rolls to the table would need to have the surface that they can roll on to, to make sure that they're accessible to that table. Okay. I'll make sure that they're aware of that. And that the that's, Art that's Center okay. last summer had three tables. One was accessible, two were not. They put the non-accessible table in an area where you would have the accessible table next to the asphalt where you could roll up to that table. But the accessible table was out in the middle of grass in a really bumpy area. So you couldn't actually get to the accessible table. You could only access a non-accessible table. So all they had to do was go out there and switch tables around. And I mean, I've had friends, we've gone to parks and we've started rearranging picnic tables and placing them how they need to be rather than calling you guys. But it's kind of like, these are things that need to be looked at, you know, the beginning of season to figure out, are these placed appropriately and, you know, spot check them every few weeks. Um, I mean, I, I think that's what he was saying in his response and maybe I didn't make it clear enough, but um, it looks like it's going to be right next to the parking lot. So you'd have access right there. And the other one's going to be in right next to a, um, by the pavilion. So, uh, but I'll check, check know, to make sure. Sunset, like previously, the accessible tables were placed in the middle of the sand. Okay. So you can't get there. And then the, the non accessible tables were under the pavilion. Mm -hmm. So those couldn't be used. And then the tables that could be used, we couldn't get to. All right, I'll make sure that they're right next to an area where it's flat, where you can just roll onto it, which is what you're saying, right? Yep, yep. Okay. And then like Hollingsworth was another one where the accessible table was in gravel. So if you can't get through the gravel in a wheelchair to get to the accessible table, the accessible table is pointless. <laughs> okay, I'll make sure that that's a flat surface going to it that you can get to. I'll, I'll make sure he takes care of that. And so, Jim, if there are any concerns moving forward, we can just give you a call and, and discuss sure. with you, and then it can be addressed. Yep. Okay. So, do um, you have a time frame normally when the picnic tables are out? I know it's probably late spring until the early fall or something. When do they When do they bring it back in? You mean take yeah, it away? Yeah. times do they place them, and then when do they usually remove? Oh, usually, them? usually in the spring, but you know the whole world's changed. So. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Outside of COVID. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, normally it would be in the spring and then we'd pick it up in the fall. Okay. I know they were a little bit delayed this year because there were some restrictions with the parks and playgrounds. We couldn't even have people out there. So right, right. there was no access allowed to anybody. So okay. um, yeah, I'll definitely make sure he's aware of this and that, um, that we implement that. So. Okay. Thank you, Jim. All right. No problem. Thank you. All right. We appreciate you coming, Jim. I know that uh, you've taken some time away from your, your personal time this evening, so I appreciate it. No, I'm always willing to help. So, okay. bye. Thank you. Nice bye seeing bye. everybody. Thank you. you bye. Bye, Jim. Bye. Thank you, Jim. So um, one of the other questions that was asked was relative to closed captioning for the Zoom meetings. And Stephen was able to help with this because the, the um, mayor's office and administration oversee this piece of it. So I do have some information relative to that. So I'll just kind of read what um, items were provided to me. That Zoom does not have a built-in closed caption ability. Zoom does offer the following. The host can manually type captions. The host can assign someone in the meeting to manually type captions, such as a participant on the webinar can volunteer to type these, or uh, the town can connect with the third-party captioning service via Zoom, Zoom's app 
at a cost to the town. So one cost is extremely absorbent and the town cannot fund it because it's too cost prohibitive. The second one is a person that would like to consider the cart service can place the request as has been done in the past and we can connect the cart service to the Zoom meeting link. Um, also, the t there is a post, let's see, there's an option of post webinar captioning. Zoom can produce a transcript that the town can share. They can also download and have closed captioning added to the service at a cost per minute. Um, and also BCAM is still the PEG provider and broadcast the meetings after the fact, which as we know, BCAM is exempt from the closed captioning requirements. So there is, there is quite a cost prohibitive factor to some of these for the town. But again, there is the option of someone, if they would like, they can request the car service and we can attempt to try and um, contact the state to see if that service is available to the town prior to the meeting. Um, are these costs higher because it's a municipality versus an organization? I don't know. I don't know the first thing about closed captioning. I don't know. Or we use captioning all the time on very soon meetings I'm on that we use the services. Um, like UMass and Mass Health meetings, we use them for other smaller, like I just spoke on a panel for a small art program out in um, the Midwest and they had it and it was only 12 participants and it was just something they automatically had included and it was just some small nonprofit. Um, I, I don't have any idea. I know that it notes that live captioning and automated solutions and estimated cost is between 15000 to 20000 25000 per year. It must be a municipal cost then. I have no idea. Stephen, are you on the line that you might be able to offer? I can't speak to the exact cost if it's uh, relating to municipalities. Um, all I know is that that was the information that was provided to me. Um, so as to if it's relating to municipalities, that's something I can look into, but that, that information I don't have at this time. So it's not that the town is not trying to provide this ability, it's right now that we don't have the ability to do it. Um, you, you need to also understand that, unfortunately with uh, the pandemic, the town is not um, receiving the revenues that it has in the past. So um, I can tell you for certain that budgets are absolutely, have absolutely been tightened and so the funding isn't available as it may have been in the past. So those are the questions that were asked at the previous meeting. Um, if there are any other questions, we can try and get them addressed for the members. I think we're, if there are no other questions, then we can move on to the other agenda items, Lynn, if you'd like. Okay. Um, the next agenda item was the updates with Christina regarding the AARP grant status, the shared street and spaces grant, the sunset lake fencing, and then Mary Beth, um, the, the finances. So we'll start with Christina, if, if you're there and go ahead and move on into the AARP grant status. Uh, yep, I'm here. So I got an email from them on July 13th, and unfortunately, we were not one of the munis municipalities that were chosen for this uh, grant. They had over 2,800 applications, and they only funded 184 projects. So it was really selective. Um, I questioned them why we didn't get picked, and they said sometimes the decision came down to a project category, geography, or innovation, and not the strength of the, of the proposal. Um, the nice thing is uh, on August 20th, or around there, the AARP Community Challenge website will have a list of project summaries and some videos of the potential of the um, projects that were selected and funded. So um, I'll be interested to see what was chosen uh, and get some ideas for next year for sure. So it's a bummer, but at the same time, gives us an opportunity to see what they were looking for, I guess. Well, if I could jump onto what Christina was mentioning, we feel like we had a very strong proposal. And as I said, it'll be interesting to see what they come out with as far as the list that was approved. 
and what area they're looking at mm -hmm. for general funding or projects because we would certainly like to apply again in the future and hopefully be successful next time. I mean, I sat down with uh, our grants writer, our director of um, Parks and Recs, uh, and Jim uh, to all, to write a really strong um, application. So we'll have to wait and see a few more weeks to see what sort of projects were funded and how innovative they were in sending in their proposal. So we do have a very strong uh, grant writer in Lorraine C with the town of Braintree. And so she'll take anyone's application for grants, not only from this department, but any other departments, making sure that it's following all the criteria requirements of the grant application, and then also enhance it as she has you know, done so many of them that she understands what the strengths are that can help with the grant proposal. Unfortunately, this one was not approved. So we hope, we're hoping to apply again in the future once we see what they generally fund and then put together another proposal. Okay, Christina. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. So the next one is the um, the shared street, the shared street and spaces grant. So again, I'm working with Jim and Lorraine and our new engineer James. Correct. Yes, uh, James just started about a week ago, so he's fairly new to all of us. James yeah, Thompson is our new engineer. Yeah, I think he uh, literally started on the twentieth. So we are um, still working on the application for um, the grant proposal to um, update for, um, to help uh, do the Safe Routes to School uh, initiative. So we're trying to upgrade the crosswalks and the signals um, at four schools, um, the Flaherty School, the Morrison School, Highlands and Hollis um, to update and uh, everything, crosswalks, the signals and all that stuff. So like I said, we've been working together. I think we're almost at the point where it's almost done. Um, it's been a lot of back and forth, a lot of input. So um, we have until the end of September, I believe, um, but Lorraine likes to get things in early. so. I'm sure it'll be done sooner than later. Okay, and Christina, can you provide an update on the fencing that I know you've been okay. looking at estimates? So I reached out um, to two places um, and the owner of Thayer Fencing got back to me last Thursday um, and he I sent him pictures of what we were looking at and what um, one of the board members, commission members had recommended um, and he was supposed to get out there Friday of last week to measure um, the area that we were uh, talking about and he was going to try to crunch the numbers and get an estimate. And I, he understands at this point that it's just an estimate that we're looking for um, and you know, once we get that information, we'll move from there. So interestingly, as, as far as the fence company, Christina's had some difficulty in getting quotes and not for on any um, due diligence on her behalf because she has been trying to reach out. Surprisingly, during the pandemic with many people at home, they've been doing a lot of renovation projects, including fencing projects at their home. So the fencing companies are extremely busy trying to meet the demands of their customer base with all of that. We found it a little surprising, but that, that is quite true as to what's happening. A lot of people are doing renovation projects in their home, including installing new fencing. It was definitely eye-opening. I had reached out to three different fencing companies and emailed them and made phone calls multiple times. So yeah, I guess if you're home and you're able to update your home, that's great. So safety first. Right, so um, Christine's gonna continue to try and get uh, additional quotes because it's something that we have to do and we're hopeful that we're able to get that in a timely fashion so we can bring it forward to the, the commission. And lastly, I do want to provide an update on the finances. So the, as of today's date, the 
current balance on the handicapped parking fines account is $48,195.28. So certainly, hopefully, if we can get the fencing piece for Sunset Lake Playground addressed, that some of the monies could come from the, the um, funding through the, the commission's endorsement and then the mayor's approval. We haven't, at this point, brought it forward to the mayor yet for even discussion because we're still trying to get the quotes. Um, can I ask about another project I'm hearing about? Sure. Um, I think it's Middle Street. There's like a walking path that they're working on renovating. So the, the walking path is down at Watson Park. Um, oh, no, it's not Watson Park. It's Middle Street, um, the Riverway Walk. On Middle Street? I don't know anything about that. It runs, it runs along the Manatiquit. There was funding. Right. So that's, we actually, Russ and I were talking about that this morning. Okay. There will be a walking path um, going behind, is it the old, on Allen Street, the old. Um, it's the Belt house? property. The Belt no, property. That's different. I'm talking the Manatiquit Riverway. We can check with the Conservation Commission because they would be involved with that. I'm not familiar with that project. Okay, yeah, somebody was asking me about that, if we had any involvement and had seen the plans for, they're improving the walkway. It's supposed to be like community trail for community walking. Um, and they were asking what the commission was doing around that um, for accessibility just as a walking trail. Yeah, we can ask conservation and bring that information back at the next meeting. Yeah, I'd like to, if they could bring it in to us, I'd love to see it before things get finalized um, but there was some big um, money that I believe they got towards the improvements I think there was a grant or something okay so um, yeah yeah we'll bring that we'll plan to get the information from conservation and try and get you some information for the next board meeting okay do we have any other playground construction or anything like that going on currently or about to happen? Christina, I'm not aware of anything. Are you aware of anything? Uh, no, Nelson's budget is basically spent. Um, I think he's at this point just doing maintenance, but I can ask him tomorrow at our DPW meeting. So, we'll get the, so again, with COVID, many of the department's budgets were yeah. Fair. So, I figured I was just wondering. Yeah. If so, we'll get some more information for you and bring that forward at the next board meeting if there are future projects that are involving playgrounds. And the town hall building that's been brought to us repeatedly in the past on um, the plans for is all that changed now that we have a new mayor? Are you talking about the old water and sewer building that's across the parking lot from yeah, the town? Yeah, they hall? Had brought the plans in, they had talked about the lift and the alternative routes. That, that is. I don't even know if that's even on the table anymore. That's what I was just curious. I like, hadn't so, heard about that in a while, so I was like, what's going yeah, on? I'll talk, to, I'll talk to Christine Stickney with planning. She was part of that whole, um, the CPC funding. So I'll bring that to her attention and ask. And Peterson Pool is currently on hold over a water table issue? Drainage yeah. water table. Mm -hmm. Yep. So okay. we haven't even seen plans on Peterson Pool. They haven't submitted anything yet. Okay. Um, and East? East is in its final stages of- Yeah, I just walked it a couple weeks ago with the um, project manager. You walked it? Yeah, he had me go out there. Okay. Well, I rolled it, technically. Okay. Yeah, because there's multiple ADA violations. We were going over some of that stuff because he was making a sh uh, checklist of everything to complete before school opens. Okay, well, were you asked as a commission member or no, as a- No, asked citizen? as school board sent me to him and then he said can you come out here and let's go over the property and there was like a dozen violations that some of it was design flaws that he's trying to correct okay so you're doing it as a citizen mm -hmm. okay so it was craig de rosa that you're working with no it's um what's his name um He's the project manager for Hill. Oh, Mike Carroll? Yes. Okay. He's really nice. 
Yeah, he was very so nice. You do the inside and the outside. Um, there was a couple of other things once he brought me on the inside that it was like a couple of emergency evacuation issues that I pointed out that are easily correctable, but were oversight and design um, that he's definitely going to address. But on the exterior, there were several violations around parking, um, missing railing on the stairs for the staff lot, um, missing curb cuts at the crosswalks. Um, there's no access into the main parking lot. They ended the sidewalk access with no curb cut um, and they provided a separate area of handicapped parking, but that's problematic um, for multiple reasons. Um, him and I were looking at that and yeah, he's taken it back to them because there's only one curb cut out of that side of the building. And in the event of an emergency, if you can't use that one curb cut, that's a problem for evacuating students because it's right next to a building. If the building was on fire in that area, it's like then you have people trapped. Um, not every disability is permanent. Not everybody has a placard to use handicap parking. They may be coming from the regular lot. You may have strollers and other people that need um, to use that sidewalk that aren't necessarily disabled or people on crutches short term, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Can you do me a favor and just send me a list of the, the items that you spoke with Mike about so I can follow up with him? Yeah, yeah, I can. I've got, I've got a few pictures. Um, yeah, and he was saying, because the school department sent me to him. That's how I ended up connecting with him. And okay. then- So, um, and what, how did you get to the school department? Did you go to the school department to request something concerning that? Or was, yeah. was there another concern? Every time Sophie switches schools, I have to go look at the property because I need to know how to get there from public transit. Because there's two different bus routes, so I, have to figure out where the bus routes are in relation to the school. When I went out there, I was yeah, like, so you, you were going there as a you were going there as a parent of yeah. somebody that was going to yeah. be going yeah. To because the problem the is, if you show up on day one with the full parking lot, you can't find the curb cuts, but the cars are parked everywhere. Um, so I was go every time she switches schools or any sort of event like that. Okay. I go in advance. It was just I, I didn't understand the context yeah. of, of yeah, the timing of it or how it how it came about. Yeah. yeah. So I went out there for that. So then I contacted somebody in the school board. I was like, Hey, this is what I'm seeing. The construction's still ongoing. What's going on? So they sent me to Hackett. Told them to send sent me over to the construction manager. I contacted him. He's like, Hey, can you meet me there because what you're saying is what I'm seeing and let's make sure I see all the violations you're seeing. And then there were several more I spotted he hadn't noticed. So um, there was a problem. They have to re-level handicap parking area because it was on a slope. Um, there was violations with another park, handicap parking area that they have to correct. Um, they intersected a ramp into a sidewalk but put up walls. So if you've got like a person in a wheelchair, they're suddenly coming around a wall because they intersected a ramp into the kitchen into the middle of the sidewalk. But when you put a wall up and there's traffic coming, you don't necessarily know that a wheelchair user could pop around the wall, if that makes sense. It's mm -hmm. a visibility problem. And he said that the ramp wasn't designed to intersect the sidewalk um, and it wasn't meant to be like an ADA compliant ramp. That's what made it so long and intersected when they built it. Um, it was only for kitchen carts to get in and out of the kitchen. Right, um, it, was, it, was, it wasn't designed as a per people mover. It was designed as simply moving the food into the kitchen area. Right, but when they made it so long, they ended up obstructing a sidewalk and pushing you into the parking lot. But when they put a wall up to protect the ramp, you're blocking the view of a person on a sidewalk about to come out around a wall. And it's just a dangerous, like for a driver and somebody who can't see if you've got a child in a wheelchair about to dodge out who might not be able to. Well, chances are a ch child in a wheelchair would not be coming down. I understand your, your yeah, situation, you the spot but you they were anticipating that safe. because they're using yeah. it as food transport, not people transport. Oh, no, no, it's that. It's not that. It's that the sidewalk, you can't see around the walls the way they put these walls up to protect the ramp. That when the sidewalk ends, you have to go around the middle of the ramp into the parking lot and then get back on the sidewalk it's it's really it's a weird design it's like what is this and he said that the, the ramp was not supposed to intersect the sidewalk and it ended up doing that and you know weird things like that so um and then the whole not providing access into the parking lot at all the main parking lot because they gave accessible parking elsewhere they didn't think they needed to provide access to the parking lot but i'm like not everybody has a placard for various reasons and i often have to go to a regular parking lot 
to meet like Girl Scout parents to drop Sophie off and pick her up. They can't come to the handicap spot. I have to go to them. So then they're forcing me like three, 400 feet against traffic instead of using a sidewalk where I'd be safer to go into a parking lot. And it's a double lane of traffic with the flow over there. Um, you know, big red flags. I was like, all we need to do is put a curb cut at the end of this. It's brand new construction. They even went so far to put up a sign to tell you there was no access. So they noticed there was no access and they put up the sign there was no access on the sidewalk instead of providing the access. <laughs> so if you want to send the, your, the questions that or the, the issues that you had to me, I can follow up with Mike Carroll. Okay. And then, oh, you have to go the entire length of the front of the property before there's another curb cut. There's multiple crosswalks, but no curb cuts at the new crosswalks to the front of the school. So you have to stay in the busway to get to the end, to get to the other one. So again, once you actually put vehicles there, that's dangerous. Um, so if you put the curb cuts, there's a way to get on and off. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, yeah. So that, that list was made and, and uh, I'm certain, I know, the, uh, I know the beginning of school has been delayed until at right. least the fourth to the 21st um, so it's just so people people recognize that that uh, they're still working on the plan um, for the pandemic um, pandemic access to schools for everyone um, so uh, so that's something to to realize that that work is still going on and uh, and still still probably as far as school department is and as far as uh, as far as some of the the um, efforts of management probably still focus very highly on that um, at this time. Some of this is actually because I started, there's a couple of parents that are disabled with kids at that school that are wheelchair users. And I was hearing about mm -hmm. it from the wife of one of the dads who was explaining this. And I didn't know the magnitude until I actually physically went there to figure out how to get there from the buses. And well, yeah, and, and I mean, for all those of us that have had children that have already been through the school systems, yeah. There have been accessibility issues, certainly for quite some time, yeah. Yeah. recognizing that those skills were built many, many, many moons ago. And this construction project is probably one of the first times that they will have something at the magnitude that they'll be able to change things around. So, um, you know, we have to we have to understand that that, yes, the accessibility wasn't great. It was never designed to have people crossing over that road in front of East Middle School anyway. They didn't want people crossing over. They wanted you to either go all the way up the sidewalk or they wanted you to only cross at that stairway going into the main part of the building or they wanted you to circle all the way around to that back parking lot and come in um, on that side for the for the back part of the um, back part of the building. So but th those schools were built quite quite some time ago. And so the standards that were there at the time that they built them were probably quite different. And it's a nice time to have the opportunity to be able to upgrade things and change things now that they're having some major construction done there. So um, it's a, you know, hopefully everything will be able to, uh, to be improved significantly on the majority of things that needed to have things addressed. That any other um, any other scoop on uh, questions for new business or anything along those lines? No questions on this end. Do we have any public here? No. Okay. It doesn't look like on anyone on the line. No. No one on the line. Okay. So so no public comment on anything. Um, do we have? Does anybody have any other issues to bring up? Uh, yeah. I just have one question. Uh, just curious to know when the crossing lights might be working in front of uh, Born Meadow Park. If anybody has a rough idea on a timeline for that. I'll have to reach out to DPW and Bell's, Mary. I'm not sure about that. What's the question? I'm just curious, that's all. Yeah. Some... I'll reach out to uh, Bell and DPW and see if they can provide an update. Or, yeah, Belden DPW. Thank you. What's the question? The crosswalk lights at Pond Meadow. Okay. Uh, 
I believe engineering has a grant for that. Let me confirm tomorrow um, at our DPW meeting. Great, thank those, you, Christina. Those have been broken a while, right? Yeah, I had my friends when I was in <laughs> was hit by a car there. Eighty three, right. Um, so I believe John Morris mentioned it last week, but let me confirm. Okay. Thank you, Christina. Okay. Um, any other issues for anyone? Well, that's made it through the agenda. Um, so um, if there aren't any other issues, do I have a motion to, um, uh, actually the next meeting would be occurring um, when? Does anybody have a calendar? Uh, I do, hold on. September 7th? That's the holiday, so it won't, oh. it, um, it looks like September 14th. Okay. Um, so the next meeting would be on September 14. Um, again, a probably I'm assuming a Zoom meeting, um, 6:30 p.m. Um, and uh, do I have a motion to adjourn the August 3rd meeting from the Commission on Disabilities? I make a motion. Okay, we have a motion and um, uh, roll call. Uh, and then do I have a second? Okay, so then I have to go through the roll call again to get a verbal on everybody saying okay. So, Crystal, do we have an okay to adjourn the meeting? Crystal Evans, aye. Okay. Um, do I have a yes from Mary to adjourn the meeting? Okay. Do I have a yes from Robin Torpe to adjourn the meeting? No. Okay, and Lynn Valancourt, yeah, a yes to adjourn the meeting. So the meeting on Commission on Disabilities for August 3rd is, um, is adjourned at 7.34 p.m. Great, thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you, everyone. Be safe. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Sorry. Thank you very much. Okay. Everything you guys are doing. Are you having problems connecting on the Zoom meetings? No, I mean, I, I 